Greg Mortensen, has dedicated this last decade to promoting education, especially for girls in remote parts of Central Asia. As of 2009, Greg had established over 90 schools in this rural and often volatile region and provided education where few such opportunities existed before to over 34,000 children, including 24,000 girls. <laughs> Greg quotes an African proverb, educate a boy and you educate an individual, educate a girl and you educate a community. He believes that educating girls is one of the major answers to bringing economic development, peace, and prosperity to impoverished societies and says, you can hand out condoms, drop bombs, build roads, or put in electricity. But until the girls are educated, a society won't change. <laughs> Greg is the co-founder of the nonprofit Central Asia Institute that promotes and supports community-based education, especially for girls, in northern Pakistan and Afghanistan. He is also the founder of Pennies for Peace, an international service learning program that provides the tools to empower communities through education in both Pakistan and Afghanistan. And in 2009, Greg received Pakistan's highest civil award, the Star of Pakistan, for his effort to promote education and literacy in rural areas. Now, several bipartisan U.S. congressional representatives nominated Greg for the Nobel Peace Prize in both 2008 and 2009. NBC newscaster Tom Brokaw calls Greg one ordinary person with the right combination of character and determination who is really changing the world. Please welcome Greg Mortensen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Callum and Dessa and everyone at the Marion Institute and the Bioneers. It's, it's such an honor to be here. My family was going to actually be with me, but we had some things happen, so I'd like to also uh, greet you on behalf of my family and all the kids in Afghanistan and Pakistan. I love to visit schools, and if you want to, we have a kids' talk at 1.30 but it's gonna be geared towards kids. So those of you adults who have a kid in your heart, you can come if you want. Uh, we'll just be um, talking about some kids' issues and about peace, and also we'll have some questions. So if you're welcome, it's uh, free, and you can come in at 1.30 if, you're, if you'd like. So I visit lots of schools every year. I go to maybe 100 and 150 schools from kindergarten all the way through graduate schools. And the first question I always ask students is how many of you have talked in great detail to your grandparents or your elders about the Depression or World War II or the Vietnam War or the Civil Rights Movement? And do you want to guess what the average is here in the U.S.? How many kids have done that? More than about 10 hours. And it doesn't matter whether it's a public or private school or urban or rural school. Do you want to guess? 2%, pretty close, 5%, 5%, very consistently. Now, if I ask the same question, in rural Afghanistan or Pakistan or even in Africa, 90 or 100 percent of the hands come up. And I think it's one of the greatest tragedies of our country that we've lost that tradition where we can learn from our elders. And what do we learn from our elders? We learn about our culture and our heritage and our traditions 
and the important historical lessons. We also learn about you know, many of the things that really mean something to make us really a great community. So one of the things that we do in our schools in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and also now in our Pennies for Peace program, which is in about 5,400 schools in the U.S., is we, we have the elders come in and talk to the kids. And I think we are looking for solutions in this chaotic world that we have so many problems, but we've never, we've always been able to go through those problems in our past. And I think it's so imperative. I think the real hope for change, it's with our kids. We also have to make that connection with our elders and our grandparents so that we can go forward and have peace and create change and live in a sustainable community and a world. So I'd like to start off with a short DVD. It just was just made. Um, it's about 11 minutes long, and it looks at a village in Afghanistan where they have to make the decision between security and education. In the case of a lander, education won out over security. So you can go ahead and hit the DVD. Can everybody see the screen? Afghanistan is different than Pakistan in that I see it a little bit more as a warrior culture. For 2,000 years, it was the Mongols, Genghis Khan, the Greeks, the Ottomans, the British, the U.S. Um, so the people have had to be warriors for a long time. Even in a warrior culture, they, they're, they're sick and tired of war now. And what they want is peace, and they want peace through education. It's uh, March 12th, Kabul, Afghanistan, and we're going to Lalander Village, Charasaib Valley, south of Kabul, to see the school project with Wakil. Uh, yeah, we are going to Lalander, uh, which is far, uh, uh, about uh, 30 kilometers from Kabul, and uh, that, uh, that is very really a poor village, and that there is no school. Uh, Mr. Greg wants to make a reconstruct a school there. Greg went into Afghanistan with this commitment to seeking out the most remote communities, uh, the communities that were far away from the, um, you know, the capital city. When Wakil first raised the idea with Greg of building a school in the Lander, Greg immediately kind of rejected it out of hand, simply based on the notion that anything within a thir within 30 kilometers of Kabul was not, by definition, remote. Uh, as we're driving along. I saw several, about eight steel truck containers. And inside each of them was 60 to 80 boys uh, with a teacher during their school lessons. I walked up to this um, armored personnel carrier. It was painted green, Soviet era. It was quite shelled out. Um, APC, and on, on white lettering, on the big letters on the outside, it said, approved project. And then I stuck my head inside the APC, and there were 12 ninth graders with a uh, teacher learning English, and quite maybe seventh grade English. What's the master's name? So we turned around, and there 
up on the hill were another 300 girls doing school. They were outdoors um, in the dirt. I told them, I, we will help you build a school. And it wasn't until um, 2009 that we built the girls' high school in the same spot. Well, going to La Landa first time, going there, I realized this is actually quite a remote area. It's a very isolated valley. It's also the, the alternative path that the, all the Mujahideen used to fight the Russians and later the Taliban. When you get to uh, La Landa, you can see it's, it was bombed relentlessly by the Russians, you know, time and time again, even after there was nothing left to bomb. And then getting to La Landa and seeing um, the, the repercussions of, of, of a war that ended 20 years ago, uh, you know, with the Soviets and all the, and all the landmines. So then I, as we were driving there, I said, Wakil, where are we going to put a school? And Wakil, he very, he quickly said, well, we're going to let the community decide. So I realized this man already knew some things that I was a proponent of. I think they should make an education committee. And that time you made a jerga and we asked from the jerga, what do you want? That the important thing what we need that's a school. We need school for our children. That we need education for our children. Different um, Mullah or Shura have so need control from education committee. Not to Malik, not to another person. Yes, we have to education committee. But then we have to distribute that one. Yes. But I don't know this okay. other place. Education committee best. Uh, yes, no, no Wakil, no me, uh, no commandant the yes. outside. Only education. But it just belong to them. Once we started in the lander, it was Wakil who, who, who managed everything along with the, the elders of the Shura of the lander. They worked very hard, uh, fastidiously. They worked every day, 12, 14 hours. Um, they also, I was, I was a little bit surprised at how beefy or strong Wakil made the school. He told me this is going to be bombproof from the Taliban or American bombs, nobody can bomb our school. And there's, there's landmines, I mean, all over that area. And anywhere you would build a school in that village, you wouldn't be far from, from that. If you look up to the hill, um, you'll see all these small white marks. And these are all the places where landmines um, have been or have been removed. There you have, you know, two of the most powerful values in Afghanistan juxtaposed against one another. The desire for education and the desire for security. Education won out in Lalander. You know, there were kids in Lalander, all of whom were looking forward to attending this new school. No one's enthusiasm um, for the idea of being able to attend classes and learn how to read and write exceeded the enthusiasm of this one little boy by the name of Gomarjan. I met Gomarjan Gomar in uh, 2003. What I remember about him, he was a very bright student. He was very intelligent. He was so excited about the possibility of going to this school that he would herd his goats up to the construction site every day to kind of monitor what was going on. When will you finish the school, the building of the school? I want to come to read and uh, with the teachers. I told him, yes, uh, maybe in uh, Six months, uh, the, it will, the building of the school will finish. Then you can, with uh, your sister and friends, you, you will read in the school. That time was, I was uh, in the mosque when I heard this, uh, the sound of this. It was very big explosion. Just less than 100 meters or yards from the school, um, there was, he was walking and uh, there was a loud bang that, and boom that resonated through the valley. This, the, the, the sounds uh, ricochet, uh, echo through this area. They raced down there and there was Gumajan. He had, he had blown up his uh, legs and he was in very severe shock. He wasn't killed or dead yet. And there was no 
functioning vehicle in the community at the time. So they they uh, they wrapped up kind of a tourniquet and then they tried to take him by walking and by bicycle and and he died a few hours later. Gunmajan Sawadi Maktadi Talim Deshaku. Dear Armani do Gorada is Maktab Julu, Agatabate, the Gunmizaba Sabakwarko, Payo Kurke, Autos for the Dinada de Marcus and Dana Nomada, Dan Mindas, Latino, Kabarkim, Sasia Dara Madralu, the Halagra Saradi, Yatim de Seraul, the Kabar Jaita, the two. No, Daya Harakas, the Damakas Marada, Daba Dinda, Dada Nora Lacani, Halo Gora, Kaduna Kayo, who be here like I was at you. When you meet Gil Marjan's dad, the, the first thing you notice and the thing that really stays with you is his eyes. They're deep, they're sad. He pulled himself through an, an intense personal tragedy, um, having lost his son. What he did with his life was go and learn how to remove those minds so that other children and other fathers and mothers would not have to go through that same thing. But there's something about his face where it's just almost like that whole story is there, that, um, that the beauty and the pain. When Gomajan was killed in uh, 2006, he was buried and they had the big pile of stones around his grave, which we've now turned into a memorial tribute with a grave and a big flags. And then we built a, called the Gomajan Memorial Trail, but it goes about 60 meters all the way to Lalander School. Things will move on. Things are improving, you know, for these children and this, and this next generation. But never forget that it's important to remember the people who paid the ultimate sacrifice. and and. That's part of their education, I think, in the way that Greg sees it. I thought it's a part of their history, their, all the deaths. By, I guess we built it for two reasons, for, for safety and then to honor Gomajan's death. The title, Stones into Schools, comes from uh, experience I had with uh, Komandan, who's a militia commander, Sadar Khan. We were sitting on the roof and he looked up at the mountains and he said, do you see those stones in the mountains and boulders? Every one of those is a Shahid or martyr who died fighting our enemies, the Taliban or the Russians. Now we must turn those stones into schools. We now have women's literacy centers and even a computer center. We continue to build schools in Afghanistan, but the need never seems to end. Thanks. I think, you know, we have a lot of problems in the world today. We have environmental degradation, we have wars, we have, you know, all kinds of problems. We could go on for all day about that. But I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges that we face in the next generation is the fact that there are 120 million children in the world today who are not in school. And about 78 million of those are female. In, you know, if we wanted to, I'm talking about the global society. We could eradicate global illiteracy in the next decade, and the cost for that, you know, our government calls a bailout, but I call it investment. You invest in education, is about six billion dollars a year for 10 years. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but it's about three to five dollars per month per child. Every single child on this planet would be able to have the right to read and read and write in the next decade. And there are. In fact, that's why, you know, adults, we haven't done very well. So what we're telling kids is 
there are enough pennies in the U.S. and Canada, if we could round up all those pennies, we could eradicate global literacy. And if you don't want to send your pennies overseas, we could double our public national education budget for one year if we could just get all our pennies. And I would encourage you, if you want to do it in New Bedford or Fall River or something, keep it locally. Don't send it to D.C. Keep it locally here in your own school systems. So um, there are hundreds of thousands of kids in West Africa who harvest cocoa. Every year, three million tons of cocoa have to be harvested to make all the world's chocolate. Cocoa grows in a little pot in a tree. You hit it with a stick, and it falls down. And then you crack it open with a machete. But it, it takes very nimble fingers to open up the cocoa pod to get the extract. And most of that labor is done by children. And in Congo, previously Sierra Leone, Burundi, Angola, um, West Africa, tens of thousands of children at a very young age, six, eight, or 10, are taught to maim and hurt and even kill people. If you teach a child how to kill before they mature, they'll kill with impunity. And there's, there's um, there, in Congo today, I'm just gonna ask you this question. Congo is the greatest crisis of war on this planet today. In the last six years, three million people have been killed in Congo. So I'm gonna ask you here, how many of you were aware of the fact that in the last six years, three million people have been killed in Congo? Okay, that's maybe 2% of you. You know, I was thinking, you know, maybe since there's no news from there, why don't all the rival TV stations and newspapers team up together and send, you know, two or three people to Congo and really report to the West what's going on there because it's, um, it's a crisis that, you know, I've talked to people about there. It's just, you know, it's, it's really tragic that this is going on today. And then uh, next time you pick up a football or soccer ball, it'll probably say made in Pakistan. And if you look at it very closely, you'll see there are small leather felt patches sewn together with very small stitches. And most of those soccer balls are made by kids. There's an area south of Salkot in eastern Pakistan. Child slavery was abolished in Pakistan six years ago, but what happened is it went underground. It's even more rampant than any time, so I'm not telling you to quit eating chocolate or you know, to quit playing soccer, but we need to be aware of the fact that a lot of this stuff is done by kids. In China, a lot of the fireworks are made by children. And um, if you look at, also in Cambodia, 100,000 kids have to harvest rice. Rice grows underwater about 12 to 18 inches. And these kids work 12 hours a day with their feet underwater because their workers don't want to buy them a $3 pair of rubber boots so they get foot rot and fungus. And perhaps the greatest tragedy, I think, on this planet is that more than any time in history, modern day slavery is very rampant but it's mostly slavery and exploitation of children. So I'd like to introduce you to a modern day slave. This uh, young man, his name is Abdul, and he's from Pol Khomri in northern Afghanistan. And we met him in 2005. We were driving down the road and our radio blew up. So we pulled into a local garage and I asked for a mechanic and Abdul jumps out and very quickly in two hours, he fixed our radiator. And I started talking to him and I asked him, how come you're not in school? And he told me he was an orphan, he had been bought and sold into slavery, and he was working 12, 16 hours a day. He didn't even get any money, just got food, and he got to sleep underneath a truck unmolested at night. So we told Abdul, we'll be back in a month and we want to help you out. But when we got back to Polkomri, Abdul had disappeared. And our staff, we spent two days looking for Abdul, but we couldn't find out where he was. And every time we go through there, we still inquire. So I have his picture on my desktop and I say desk and laptop. I get all these mixed up. But, um, to remind me that, you know, of all the problems we face, there's absolutely no reason why any single child on this planet should be a slave, and that every single child on this planet should have their right, as guaranteed in the, the United Nations Declaration and Charter, that they should be able to be able to read and write and go to school. We also, as you saw earlier, landmines is a huge problem in the world. Um, in Afghanistan, three, two, five kids die every day from landmines. And there has been a charter signed in Ottawa about eight years ago. Nearly every country on this planet has signed, it's called the International Commission to Ban Landmines, that the production and usage of landmines 
will be prohibited and also all landmines would be destroyed. The U.S. is one of very few countries in the world that has not signed the land mining treaty. In fact, last November, President Obama refused to sign the land mine treaty because the U.S. is one of the fourth largest manufacturers of land mines. Um, we produce cluster bombs, over three million cluster bombs, and when a cluster bomb falls on the ground, it becomes a landmine. So uh, my son Kyber, who's 10, he was very disturbed enough when he was in Pakistan to see kids missing their limbs from landmines. So he started a campaign called Ban Landmines, and we're trying to get kids now to get up to Capitol Hill and encourage our leaders to ban landmines, because I've even spoken to many military commanders, and they've told me there's no reason to have landmines in the world today. We, they have other means, you know, we say satellite and motion detectors and all that stuff, so there's no reason that there should be any landmines in the world today. And I think, hopefully, if we can get the kids' message out there, that we can ban landmines forever. So, I wrote, my daughter, my daughter, Mira, um, she loves to rap and do slam, and so she's not here. She can uh, tell you what three cups of tea means in a real cool way, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try and copy that. <laughs> So what three cups of tea means is the first cup, you're a stranger, second cup, a friend, and the third cup, you become family. And for a family, we're prepared to do anything. So um, I think um, one of the solutions in Afghanistan is something we haven't really considered, and that is, as I mentioned before, we need to put the elders in charge, empower the elders. Um, I, I frequently go also to volunteer and help with the military to understand the culture and the traditions of a tribal society. So I have my 10-year-old son, Kyber, create this little PowerPoint, and this is what I show the top military commanders. <laughs> now, if anything goes wrong here, I'm not going to be able to fix it. So traditional society is based on the very beautiful relationship between the E as the elders there, and the Y, the youth, and then the mullahs, or the, the spiritual leaders. And this goes back for several thousand years. But over time, outside forces started having influence. There was the Soviet uh, the fall of the monarchy, the Soviet invasion in 79, and then the uh, anarchy, and then the Taliban, and then the US military, and everything else. So over 20 years, civil society really disintegrated. And what's, what's really destroyed the structure of society is that the youth started going away from the elders. They were pulled out and isolated and started getting indoctrinated so that uh, strong, the strength of civil society was disrupted and over a couple decades became totally destroyed. So here, this is my 10-year-old son stuff. I, like, so anyways, um, let's see, okay. <laughs> now you're gonna see the youth there go off of the F. These are fighters and militants, extremists, and um, then they start to form a coalition, or they start bonding with each other, but they, they also feel empowered and they get their identity from with the radical mullahs and with the fighters. But you can see how very few elders now are involved in influencing the next, the second generation. Do any of you know how to do this stuff? <laughs> okay. And then you have a coalition form and then Here's the Afghan-Pakistan border, outside influence, more funding comes in, and you can see how over time, really civil society is totally disrupted. So then the real question is, you know, how do we help put this back together and really empower the people? So I just, a little bit I think is in the lessons I learned in my childhood. I was very lucky to grow up in Africa. My, I went there three months old and I stayed there till I was 15 years old. My father started a hospital called the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center. But one thing my father always insisted on was to have local people in charge. Now that didn't go very well sometimes with the Europeans and Americans. They would say you need a, in Swahili, it's a mzungu with a kiboko. It means a white man with a hippo hide whip if you want to get anything done. But my father always insisted that Africans be in charge, including his own boss. And finally, the hospital opened up in 71. And my father got up to give a little speech he said he predicted that in 10 years, all of the department heads of the hospital would be from Africa. And basically, my father got fired within a couple months 
for having the audacity to believe that Africans could run this hospital within a decade. Anyways, we came back to the States, and my father unfortunately died from cancer in his mid-40s, but 10 years later, we got the annual report from KCMC Hospital, and all the department heads were from Tanzania. And even today, 40 years later, all the department heads of the KCMC Hospital are from Tanzania. And the, what this lesson is, or in sustainability, you know, we all of us here, especially here, the Bioneers, we all have an innate desire. We want to help people. It makes us feel good. We do it because of our conscience or intuition. But if we really want to help people, we have to empower people. And there's a very big difference between helping and empowering. And empowering begins through education. And the real enemy we all face in America, in Europe, in Afghanistan, in Asia, in Pakistan, the real enemy is ignorance. And it's ignorance that breeds hatred. To overcome ignorance, we compassion, courage, and most of all, I think, it's based in education. So as um, earlier, you heard this proverb, but this is the one proverb I've never forgotten that I learned doing it as a kid. And it says, if we educate a boy, we educate an individual. But if we can educate a girl, we educate a community. So how do the gentlemen feel about this? <laughs> how, wow, that's pretty good. Sometimes, sometimes like stone silence. And how do the women feel about this? <laughs> See? <laughs> I think we're, we're a little bit outnumbered here. <laughs> so um, how I started this, my sister Krista had epilepsy in 92, she died. Um, and so I decided to climb K2, the world's second highest mountain, put an amber necklace on top to honor her memory. And in 93, I went to Pakistan. This is K2, the world's second highest mountain. 84 Matterhorns can be put inside a K2 to fill it up. We spent 84 days on the mountain. Um, my two partners did some of it, but I, didn't quite make it to the top. So coming off of K2, I was really disappointed because I felt as if I let my sister down. So anybody here who read Three Cups of Tea, can, it, can anybody here remember what the first chapter is called? It's usually of a fifth grader, fourth grader. Oh, very good, who said that? Give her a big round, failure, give him a big round, failure. You know, when I submitted the original manuscript to New York, they said, Greg, in America, you never start a book with the word failure. <laughs> but you know what? We all make mistakes, and we all fail. Some of us fail in our relationships. Some of us fail in our education or jobs or other things. I was on Wall Street last year, and I mentioned some of us fail in our investments, but nobody laughed there. But <laughs> anyways, um, so next time you fail or I fail, Think of this beautiful Persian proverb that says, when it is dark, you can see the stars. So then we left K2, I walked about 58 miles, I stumbled into a little village called Corfe. These people were so hospitable, everything they had they shared with me. They're also very devout Muslims. And then one day I walked behind the village, there in the dirt were sitting about 84 kids. They were riding with sticks in the sand and a few with a uh, stick on a slate board. And there was no teacher there, and I said, Where's your teacher? Can you imagine here in New Bedford, 84 kids outside in the dirt in the fall, like today, uh, doing their school lessons? And their teacher, Master Hussein, is in the next village because they can't afford his daily one dollar salary. So when a young girl named Chocho asked me, can you help build a school? I said, I promise I'll help you get a school started. And I didn't know it changed my life forever. So I came back to the States. I wrote 580 letters. I only got one check back. I sold my car. I sold my books. I sold my climbing gear. And by springtime, I got about $3,000. And my mother, who was an elementary school principal in Wisconsin, she invited me to come and talk to kids. And it was the first time I'd ever spoken to anybody, you know, adults or kids, about my dream to build a school in Pakistan. And when I got done, there was a fourth grader. His name was Jeffrey. He came up to me, looked at me deadpan, and said, I have a piggy bank at home, and I'm going to help you. And I thought, what can a fourth grader do? <laughs> anyway, six weeks later, Westside School had raised 62,340 pennies. And when you think about it, it wasn't, it wasn't movie stars, it wasn't celebrities, it wasn't you know, anybody important, it was children. And they were reaching out to children halfway around the world, and they did it with pennies. So today we have a program called Pennies for Peace, and for lack of better words, 
It's kind of going bananas lately. Um, two years ago, it was in 280 schools. Today, it's in 5,400 schools in about 22 countries around the world. And when I, we have, we also had incredible help from the NEA, National Education Association. So we devised and have an approved curriculum now with this program that uh, there's several components. One is teaching children about culture and about environmental issues, also about learning from your elders. They have to spend 10 hours with the elders. But the most cool thing of all is we never thought is kids go out and start their own thing on their own. So I'm just going to give you a couple examples. Um, this young man, his name is um, a, a community service. Let me just talk about that one second. You know, there's kind of revolution going on in this country in the last two decades, and that is called community service or service learning. Uh, when I go to schools, generally 50 to 80 or 90 percent of school kids today have involved with some kind of community service. And if you go down into the middle schools and elementary schools, it's even much higher than that. These are places like Topeka, Kansas, or here in New England, and um, kids are going out and doing all these amazing things. And I think it's something we really need to embrace and support, and, and kids learn the concept that they can affect and make change. Kids, you know, not adults, kids. Um, so this is just one example. Zach is from Tampa, Florida. Zach is, uh, I think, 13 now. And he's, he did pennies for peace for a few years. But three years ago, he was bothered by the fact that there were homeless kids in the Tampa area. And his best friend also had trouble learning how to read and write. So Zach decided to change something. He started a foundation called Little Red Wagon Foundation. And last year, Zach walked from Tampa to Washington, D.C., and he raised over $70,000 to bring awareness to homeless kids in the U.S. And this year, Zach walked during his summer vacation from Tampa to Los Angeles, across the United States of America. He's raised somewhere in the proximity of a million dollars to bring awareness to homeless kids in the U.S. When, he, when, Zach, so when Zach set up his foundation, he called me up and he said, he, he needs to know about board directors. Now, are these are like board people, or are they like adults? I said, no, no, they're like a moral compass and fiduciary responsibility. And Zach said, could I put some kids on my board? I said, well, check the law in Florida. Well, there's no law in Florida against that, so all of Zach's board directors have to be under 18 years of age to be on Little Red Wagon Foundation Board. <laughs> and on our website, we have examples of hundreds of young kids who are affecting change and doing something. They're not thinking about it. They're going out there and doing something, and I really think something we can, when we're looking for solutions, we don't need to think too much, we just start talking to our kids. And kids can understand concepts of slavery and landmines and exploitation and racism. Kids can, can really affect change for the next generation. So I kept going back to Pakistan, I got to get a school built. I was having a lot of problems. And three years later, you can see we hadn't gotten very far. And actually the problem, it wasn't them, it was me. And I was doing something that we call micromanagement. I had my plumb line, receipts, and records, and I was determined to get the school built. Well, one day, Hajeli, the village chief, he said, if you want to build a school, you need to sit down and be quiet and let us do the work. And so then he took my plumb line, he took my records, he took my receipts, he locked them up, and he came back and said, there, don't you worry. Inshallah, Allah willing, everything will be fine. Well, I was horrified, and guess what happened six weeks later? The school got built. <laughs> and it's a very important lesson. What we talked about earlier, it's about empowering people. So today, in all of our schools, we have 165 plus three dozen other outdoor schools and in tents. We provide the teacher training and support, and I like to give a brief, you know, let's give a big round to all the teachers and educators because you are the real heartbeat of education. And the building really means nothing. So. We provide the teacher training and support and give them some impetus. We also provide the skill labor and the materials and the ongoing curriculum and support. But the communities, they have to provide free land, free labor, five to 8,000 days of free labor, and also free um, resources. So it becomes a 50-50 thing. And that's, I think, the real reason why education can get a foothold and establish in these very difficult areas. 
None of our schools have been shut down or destroyed by militant groups. There's other organizations like CARE. One of the primary reasons is because the community is totally involved from day one and the elders are running the show. So the more I do this, and as Callum said, I am convinced education has to be our, one of our top global and national and community priorities. We can drop bombs, we can build roads, we can put in electricity, we can protest, we can put in computers, but unless girls are educated, the society will never, never change. So why is educating girls so important? Well, there are three academic reasons. Number one, reduces infant mortality. Number two, reduces population explosion. Number three, improve the quality of health and life itself. Also, when girls learn how to read and write, they generally teach their mother how to read and write. It's kind of like wildfire. Boys don't do that as much. They don't go tell their, teach their dad how to read and write. And I think number two is especially important. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of problems on this planet. But also one of the biggest problems is there's simply too many people on this planet and we cannot live in harmony with our resources in the next generation or two. And it's pretty scary if you look in five generations how this planet is imploding with people. And the number one way to reduce population without doing anything else, nothing political, nothing controversial, is simply female literacy. And the best example is Bangladesh. In 1970, 40 years ago, the female literacy rate was less than 20%. Bangladesh put 6 to 8% of their GDP into education. Today, the female literacy rate has tripled. If you look at a population graph in Bangladesh, it's now just reaching an apex, 2.8 live births per female. 40 years ago, it was nine births per female. Now, unlike Pakistan, Pakistan, the female literacy rate is around 36%. The government says it's 58, but it, there's also what defines literacy. There's a big difference, you know, just learning how to write your name or fourth grade competency. Pakistan is going to double in population in the next 27 years from 175 million to 350 million people. It's the fourth fastest big growing country in the world. And if we think there's problems in Pakistan now, just think what's gonna happen in one generation. And the only thing Pakistan has never done its entire history to have a national initiative to put more than 2% of GDP into education and ensure that every single child can go to school. And until that happens, nothing Pakistan does or the international community will really make a difference until they really put education, especially female education, as a top priority in the country. So now I've got some really bad news, and I've got some good news. And the bad news is, in the last three years, militant groups have bombed, destroyed, or burned down, shut down over 2,400 schools in Afghanistan and Pakistan. What's really tragic is about three-quarters of those schools are girls' schools, and they're not boys' schools. So why do a group of big bad men armed with weapons, why are they so terrified of a little girl going to school? I mean, what's the big deal? Why are you poisoning her? Why are you throwing battery acid at her face? Or why are you taunting her, throwing stones at her? Just let that girl go to school. I think the reason they're so terrified of little girls going to school is because when that girl grows up, becomes a mother, she will help the value of education go on there in society. They have lost their ability to influence society. And in the Hadith, the Hadith is a part of Islam. It's the teachings of Islam. It says, this is in Arabic, I'll translate it to English, but it says, the ink of a scholar is holier, greater than the blood of a martyr. It means that the pen is more powerful than the sword. Now here's the good news which you heard about earlier. You know, I've asked half a million people, how many, were, how many of you were aware of this before I told you today? Go ahead. Is there any hands up here? You know, I've asked half a million people, there's one. <laughs> Where did you hear about it? Oh, in the book, okay. <laughs> uh, um, I've asked half a million people this, and only a few dozen hands have come up. I was briefing five U.S. senators on Capitol Hill about this, and afterwards they were patting themselves on the back, and I said, how can you take credit for something you don't even know about? But that's a politician for you. <laughs> now, of course, of course we deserve some credit. But the real reason those kids are in school is not because of us. It's because of them. And it's because their mothers and their communities, they will do anything in order to get their child, and especially girls, to go to school. You know, I learned from my father and Haji Ali that we need to listen. So I ask women in Afghanistan, Pakistan, what do you want? I'd really like to help you, but what do you want? 
You think most women say, well, I want a good husband, I want prosperity, maybe a big house or something like that. But you know what most women tell me? Simply two things. They say, we don't want our babies to die, and we want our children to go to school. And I think those of you who are women here, especially mothers, you can relate to that. Women bring life into the world, and it's women that nurture life. And really, in many cases, women are the propagators of education in any society. If I could bring those women here, we'd, first we'd have to figure out how to sit in a circle, then we'd take our shoes off, and then we'd have some tea, <laughs> but then they, that's what they would tell you. And what I really am excited about is finally, it was only last this July, President Obama asked to have a meeting in the White House to be advised on what are the elders saying in Afghanistan, what are the women saying. This is the first time you know, in the last nine years. And finally, you know, I, and then a month later, uh, July 2nd to 5th, President Karzai decided to copy President Obama. He decided to summon the elders <laughs> and some women to, to Kabul to see what they're saying. What they're saying is, you know, the same things. We don't want our babies to die, we want our kids to go to school. They're also saying, we don't need firepower, but we do need some brain power. Um, so I'm going to just close a couple ideas here. Um, I met the minister of higher, or I talked to the minister of higher education in Afghanistan a few months ago, and I asked him what would be your dream budget for to fund the entire higher education in Afghanistan for one year for all your 24 universities. He told me 248 million dollars. That's what it costs to run one, you know, state university in the U.S. or less. And so one idea I had is, you know, we have 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, so let's pull, let's have a big press conference, pull 248 troops, send them home, and write a check to the higher education ministry in Afghanistan for an entire year for $248 million. And I think there's also, they've discovered um, over one to two trillion dollars of very valuable mineral resources in Afghanistan. It's the stuff that's running your laptops and your cell phones and in alloys in your cars and our, my car and everything. So why don't we spend, pull another five soldiers and build a school of mines and technology in Afghanistan so that in 20 years they can be in control and empower with their own resources and Iran, China, Russia, and even the U.S. won't be able to exploit the resources of a good Afghan people. The, so, sometimes things happen in a little bit serendipitous way. So I'd just like to close with a little story from Urazgan province in southern Afghanistan. Um, our staff met two years ago in Afghanistan, our staff, and they predicted it would take 20 years to get a girls' school built in this area in Urazgan province called Dairaut in Tarankot. But only a few months later, the elders, the Shura, they came to us and said, we want to put a girls' school in our community. So I thought they're pulling my leg, and you see me, the scared white guy in the back without the beard? That's me. <laughs> so I said, well, why don't you come and visit one of our schools, and we'll have a little talk. So they came to Char Siab School. Now, these are pretty scary guys. They have big beards and black turbans and armed to the teeth with weapons. And they, I don't do a background check on them. But they said, they came to Char Siab School, and then they saw the giant playground. So these men, hardened men, they threw down their weapons and their grenades and AK-47s, and they jumped on the swings and slides, and they went for an hour and a half. They had a glorious time. <laughs> and I said, Hey guys, let's get serious. The headmaster is sitting over there for an hour and a half, patiently waiting for you, and we need to look at the curriculum. And they said, no, no, we're totally satisfied. We want a girls' school in our community. <laughs> but, and then they said, it has to have a playground. I said, no problem. <laughs> now, my only worry is that now the school's running, they're going to use a playground instead of the girls. But in seriousness, I spent, and our staff, we spent a lot of time talking to these men. Haji Ibrahim on the right, he's the chief head of all the shura in Urazgan province. He's the, he's, the, he's the heart and soul of their community. And there's Haji Yusuf on the left. And they told me, Haji Abraham said, as a child, 
I grew up in refugee camps. I grew up in war. I was taught how to hate as a child. I was taught how to kill the Russians and other enemies. He said, I never had a chance as a child to play. When I saw that playground, I became a child again. And it made me really know and understand that in the Koli Quran, that word ikra means read. And that's the first word of the revelation to Muhammad the prophet. He said that word ikra had meaning for me, that I need to become a champion for education in Uruzgan province. So um, now, um, you know, we have a big push even in this country to get kids way down into f even first grade and kindergarten on the internet. Kids do not need to get on the internet and all that stuff. They need to go out and play. They need to have... Kids need... Kids need to learn how to arbitrate and dispute, and there is a huge problem in this country with bullying, and a lot of that has to do, when I go to these schools, a lot of it has to do with children learning how to play and get along and solve their own problems. I also think, personally, that every single child in this country should be bilingual. It doesn't matter what language it is, but that's something we really need to support. So I'd like to close with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Now, I met a, a Chinese counselor recently. He said, this is an ancient Chinese quote, so I don't know who said this first, but <laughs> anyways, it says, even if the world ends tomorrow, I will plant my seed today. And that seed is right here. It's in this place. It's in everywhere. If we can glean from our elders and then impart that wisdom with our youth, I do know that the world can be a better place and we can affect change. We can push our kids but learn from our elders for our foundation. So thank you so much and really appreciate it.